Connecting. We are connecting. Okay, we are live. Let the games begin. Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Gilliland, and I am one of the founding attorneys of the Legal Geeks. We have an all-star panel of legal and military talent to talk about the first three episodes of Andor. And no, well, in Zoom order, we have Stephen Tolefield, Christine Peake, Bethany Blanton, Thomas <coughs> Harper, and Jordan Hubert, and ready to rock and roll. So lightning around. Stephen, what did you think? Two thumbs up. Um, I really enjoyed the first three, three episodes. Really immersive, cool story, uh, great characters, all in. Excellent. Christine. Um, same. I really loved how the attention built over the course of the three episodes um, and got really intense in episode three. Um, the other thing that it made me kind of associate and, and maybe make a mental note to either reread or get the audiobook was um, Neil Stevenson's 1992 novel Snow Crash, which is a science fiction novel in which the government's powers have mostly been effectively given over to private organizations. Um, so I thought I should I should take another look after this. Yeah, it also gets a RoboCop feel. Bethany, your your thoughts. Oh, I, I really enjoyed it. I am hooked, hook, line, and sinker. Uh, I just, I love the character of Cassian, even more so in the series than in the film. Uh, and I, I really can't wait to see how the character continues to progress. Excellent. Thomas. If we were a fish, I'd be fighting Bethany for that uh, hook there, <laughs> like willfully, uh, <laughs> knowing that I was going to be pulled up into the boat. Now, this is my opinion hands down uh the best live action star wars that they've made since the the disney takeover uh and and i that's not to denigrate the other stuff it's elite air and this has already risen to the top in my book excellent thank you jordan your your thoughts so i didn't know they were releasing three episodes uh the first day so i went in figuring oh well i'll watch this one 45 minute episode then i was you know, an hour or two hours later, I was like, wow, did I really just sit through all of that? That was great. Uh, no, I thought it was fantastic. I'm, I'm with Thomas. I think it's the best thing Disney's done with Star Wars. And I don't say that lightly. I also loved it. We live in a glorious time where we get all of this Star Wars content or Marvel content or Star Trek content or Lord of the Rings content game of thrones content we are spoiled rotten and anyone claiming uh complaining really needs to reevaluate their life they don't remember the dark times when it was just hercules or cleopatra 25 25 you don't know what happened in the 90s to us it was a horrible dark time so with that let's get into the many complex legal issues and this is the first time that we've seen a brothel in star wars the places in the united states where that's legal is limited so looking at the state of nevada those are a highly regulated industry and you need licensing requirements and they seem to have some at least tacit understanding with the local uh government that it's an operation. Uh, it sounded more like a prohibition era type operation where it's just being tolerated. So there's no licensing requirements there, but it's definitely a head turn uh, for, for a Star Wars show that, that did give a Blade Runner feel and multiple podcasts have, have compared it to that. Uh, I don't think we really need to get into the intricacies of brothel uh, legislation unless somebody really wants to uh, and and seeing no one jumping at that thank god people yes, said it. they wanted to get off they wanted it star wars to get off tatooine and and or delivered immediately the saint moss Eisley. <laughs> it also signals to you right away that this is not the uh the kid version prequels and we're going to be doing something different yeah you know Mommy was a brothel. Yeah, that, that'd be a fun one. So 
No. All right. Uh, and it's, I'll just just add that it sounds like there's kind of a thriving um, sex work industry, at least in in that area, because the the chief said something about where they were in a brothel that we're not supposed to have, and in one of the expensive ones that they're not supposed to be able to afford. So it sounds like there's kind of a market for it um, with varying levels of, of access to different income levels. So it's interesting that, um, that the um, corporation is somehow taking responsibility. I know we're going to talk more about this, but sort of taking responsibility for turning a blind eye to something that the corporation is not supposed to have or that the community is not supposed to have. It's a very unclear line between those two things. Yeah, I picked up on the same language as Stephen did that conversation, and it made me think, well, what is the corporation's role in this? They're not supposed to have it. They're not supposed to, um, they're not supposed to be drinking. They're not supposed to allow their officers to drink while on duty. And yet it seems like in actuality, they do allow that. So when you're listening to the we're in those sentences, you do wonder who is we, and is we actually the corporation? And is the corporation the one that's running this business when it's not really supposed to. So as Steven says, yes, very unclear. Um, I guess I guess maybe we'll find out and maybe we won't. But again, they open up with a rabbit hole for lawyers to uh, go like, you, you're doing what? Okay. Um, it, TVMA. So here, here we go. We have other issues on top of that with the Premore Authority. I think it's worth discussing how to qualify these guys because there's an element of like, are they rent a cops? Are they law enforcement? Are they private military contractors? There's some weird issues here. And who wants to take the first swing at this? What's this was the most fascinating for me aspect of the first three episodes like from a legal and just a storytelling standpoint it seems like this corporation is like an evolution of your trade federation or your <clears throat> commerce guild uh type characters from the the prequels from the clone wars area era and and now you have them sort of moving more and more into the governmental space and real world uh the government does all sorts of things uh, via contractors, via third parties, um, via the, the military has uh, quite literally an army of civilian workers uh, across all branches that carry out a variety of functions that, you know, uniform personnel probably could on some level, but you'd have to have a massive force that that uh, is is way bigger than anything we we currently have to achieve those things, and you'd you'd have other issues caused by you know personnel rotation that sort of thing. So the government does a lot of that, but there are a tremendous amount of regulations out there. Uh, the, the bureaucracy is thick, so to speak, when it comes to those roles. The government has clearly defined lines between uh, when and how contractors can be brought in, for what jobs they can be hired for. There's a, a piece of legislation called the FAIR Act, F-A-I-R, that uh, from, from the 90s that sort of demarcates uh, governmental and military functions and, and things that, that uh, these outside entities can and cannot do, what you can and cannot contract for. Uh, so in the instant, think about, about a military commander that sort of has his or her uh, uh, set of duties and responsibilities. They need to make decisions about what they can do, how to accomplish those things. They need to know where the boundaries lie uh, for, for how to do those things. And that's where those regulations come into play. It seems like the empire has outsourced a lot and maybe understandably so, but we see pre more in this, these sort of corporate tactical forces as they're described, doing a lot of stuff that is way outside the bounds of anything that we see uh, here in our world, like Amazon doesn't have an army, right? <laughs> that that yeah. know, provides gunship support to their <laughs> delivery vehicles. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's horrifying. But yeah. did anyone else get like vaguely Blackwater type vibes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah clearly, Blackwater. Uh, yeah, are there a lot of a lot of that. A lot of the private military contractor feel. 
but these guys are taking over what would normally be uh, like civilian law enforcement jobs. They're investigating ostensibly a murder. It, it, it's a posse comitatus type role with private military contractors playing law enforcement. Well, that's par for the course in Star Wars where we have stormtroopers doing law enforcement. So it's a very weird situation and it, it highlights also the uh, dangers of the security state or the terror of you know only the guilty have to you know fear the police state type feel so it there's a uh, an icky feeling all around uh, yeah i think the, that terror of like the security state i think that fascist governments are more than happy to outsource um all sorts of um w methods of terrorizing people and making them afraid um which keeps them in line in theory um but the um that's sort of typical of not just um, private corporate security officers, but also just citizens like militias. Like um, there's lots of fascist governments depend upon um, civilian organizations to be violent and to intimidate people. So it's it's very clear that the show is really leading into what a fascist government looks like at its when it's first right out of the gates. Um, this is how they're going to run things. It's so interesting. Agreed. And it raises questions. How does this interact with the Empire? Because we've never seen private military contractors or private law enforcement contractors before in our favorite galaxy far, far away. So uh, has anyone any thoughts they want to add on that? Well, we've never we've seen... seen. Go ahead, Jordan. I say we've never seen it exactly done as a corporate thing, but we've seen lots of kind of quasi police situations in Star Wars. I mean, there's the ISB, the Imperial Securities Bureau does a lot of kind of police work type thing that that may be more in the expanded universe than the and legacy now than um canon but we've also seen and even as far as uh, empire strikes back we see the empire contracting with bounty hunters uh the contracts with the huts to do patrol of kind of hut space hi kitty oh, oh kitty let's just all bow down we we know who the star of the show is now we can, <laughs> we can just bend the knee <laughs> yeah crossing streams here sorry I, that's okay it's he you sees the keyboard and wants to walk on the keyboard. <laughs> I was just like, I hope Pop it up that chat box. <laughs> yeah. It's really hard to talk with a straight face about gangsters doing law enforcement while there's a <laughs> kitty like, down to the left. Yeah. Just, Jordan, you raised an interesting point, not about the cat, but the fact that we've had the Empire work with uh, organized crime. Mm -hmm. And we've seen them like have agreements in Rebels with you know the mining guild. You know, with the using uh, the modified yeah, yeah. Tie Fighters with the yellow paint job, to uh, Mandalorian families, sex. Uh, I'm not sure how those are defined, but different clans that were doing uh, in Imperial bidding uh, in Star Wars Rebels. So, how do we how do we feel about Bespin? Because um, it's it's called, called Cloud City, but it seems like it's a corporation that's doing the mining. And all of the Cloud City security yeah. officers had, it, it seemed like they, the officers, the Primor officers were giving me Cloud City vibes with those mm -hmm. hats they had with those little, vi those little visors. It seemed like a pretty clear callback to that kind of corporate security that's serving a kind of a law enforcement function. I, the difference, oh, go ahead, Josh. Uh, it's a government town, or excuse me, it's a corporate town, which right. we've, we've seen before. And, and there are dreams of like Tesla building a corporate town in Nevada, which I'm sure would be fine. Nothing bad would happen. And yeah, historically, that's always gone great. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> you know, so there's nothing about like, I owe my soul to the company town or anything bad. So I'm, it'll be fine. Don't worry about well, it. Pre Primor has, has been given, it, it from the context clues that we have, Primor has been given 
a a system right or a set of systems that a defined territory that that's it will get into jurisdiction with some of the other issues late in, in a bit but uh that's how they're going um uh, out on this sort of hunt for for cassian there's some semblance of jurisdictional reach that extends there so it's not just on uh what is it prelox minor whatever the the main planet that they're on at the outset uh, so, so the and, Wikipedia page says, to your point, that they have jurisdiction in the free trade sector, which is okay. a series of systems or regions within the mid rim, I guess. Uh, and so um, the Wikipedia page talks about how the Primor core like the tactical portion is supposed to protect both pre-war assets as well as imperial assets because pre-war does a lot of uh business with the empire so sense. i think because the people that cassian kills are a part of pre-war is what gives them jurisdiction from their perspective yeah. And they even talk about on that planet that there are zones within that planet. When Cassian gets accosted, they, you know, the, the guards are talking about him being in a particular zone of that planet. So even within on the planet surface itself, they've got demarcated areas that that have meaning and carry different implications legally. It would make so, sense like military bases yeah. or, or like consulates or embassies are consider, considered like federal property of that. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that country basically. But that still gives them a lot of power. Like they can just set up shop anywhere and declare this is ours. Like <laughs> it, it's almost <laughs> like the like Massachusetts Bay Colony. You know, it's very 17th century style but they're not going to build a city on a hill. They're going, we're going for commerce, which perhaps is the most Puritan thing they could go do, but it's still weird because what's the economic advantage to the empire to let a corporation go run a system when you know they could just have Imperial jackboots running the show instead. So it's a very, you know, it's okay. interesting. But we've seen in other things, though that they have these corporate entities that are running things but there's always an imperial governor or something like that, that the mm -hmm. corporations report slash pay to so there is some advantage presumably to the empire and how they they generate revenue the the backdrop of all of this is the death star is being built right now i i suspect that that we have seen some scenery already without explanation to it that is evidence of that massive operation to cultivate resources and, and build this giant battle station. So with a project that, that's that big, I mean, I th think about the building of a, uh, a, a naval warship, right? It's a, a huge operation, a tiny fraction of the scale of something on the, the order of the Death Star and something that requires massive amounts of corporate and civilian power to make happen. And so it makes sense you talk about the benefit to the empire they're rapidly expanding and they're inevitably there are min bands out there from solo that are actively in rebellion and they're trying to, to clamp down on and even with a far reach like that that expansion puts a big draw on their resources which still are finite to some degree as they as they cycle out the clones and so it does present an opportunity where they can outsource the mining that work and the security, I think, from judging from some of the, the clips we've seen from future episodes, I think the Empire does is going to get involved very rapidly here. It, well, let's not speculate, but agreed. So, because we've seen previews with ISB officers running around. Uh, now, somebody put in the quote from Mosk, and for me, it's always hard to see that name because of Stanley Mosk in California. <laughs> so... We name courthouses after somebody. So again, that's it's just how you think. But uh, who wants to address the Moss quote? Because I, I can start. I put it in there. Um, it's from, I think, the second episode. Mosk is the the other guy who comes on to kind of run the tactical response to Cassian. Uh, 
says corporate tactical forces are the empire's first line of defense, which is a little terrifying if true, but in context could also be him talking himself up. Um, yeah, yeah, he's uh, he, he does have a heavy Scottish accent, so it's uh, uh, yeah. Well, he also seems like a bit of a uh, climbing the corporate ladder kind of guy. Yeah, he's likes doing the job a little too much. So let's talk about the the altercation that happens in the uh, brothel, and Cassian leaves, and he's accosted by the Primor officers. Could Cassian, if we overlook the murder, uh, have a 1983 action against the Primor officers? And Stephen, uh, those look like your initials. Can you help us understand? Yeah, I guess just 1983, of course, is the federal statute that gives people a civil remedy for violations of constitutional or for violations of constitutional rights. But it says the statute says under color of state law or under color of law. So um, you can only sue the government for constitutional violations. You can't you can't convert ordinary crimes or personal injuries into con sort of constitutional dimensions unless there's some connection to the um, to the government. So this whole the um, the ambiguity that we've been talking about, about whether the Primor is operating as a government entity or is really a legitimately private entity, entity makes a difference as a threshold matter to whether Cassian can recover. Um, and the Supreme Court has held that um, kind of private security officers who are plain or off-duty police officers who sort of exploit their um, the cachet of being a law enforcement officer are acting under color of state law, even if they're, for example, detaining someone at a bank or other private entity or, or working as security officers. So um, I, I would say that Cassian probably has a pretty strong argument because even if they're not kind of off-duty police officers, they are they have a uniform, they're behaving like law enforcement, they have weapons. Um, I, and it's clear from the um, chief's speech about how he's going to go report to the empire about their activities. It seems like the empire has kind of cloaked them in governmental authority. So assuming that there would be this kind of statute in the empire, which is completely um, <laughs> unlikely, but, um, but it seems like they would have, he would have a pretty good argument that the Primor security officers are acting under color of law. Yeah, I think it can get really messy depending on how you want to classify the officers yeah. um, as, as state actors or as coming under some um, test that courts have used to um, hold private actors accountable as if they were state actors. And I think it also probably depends on um, what is the right analogy between, for the relationship between um, the Primor guards and the empire. Right, so um, you've got sort of two things at play. You've got the under color of state law requirement, which is actually in the statute um, 4219 or 42 USC 1983. And then um, you have this additional concept of state action that's more of a matter of substantive constitutional law. It just recognizes the fact that most rights that are secured by the constitution are only protected as against infringement by governments. And so, um, you would want to maybe look at one of those uh, state action doctrines to see um, whether Cassian could satisfy that part. Um, interestingly, um, there's a one of the tests for that is called the public function test, and I thought it might be worth mentioning um, the Marsh versus Alabama case from 1946 because that case used the public function language, and it actually did concern a company-owned town. Um, that's where that um, that public function, um, I think, either came from or it, if it was quoting something, I don't know, but it's um, Marsh v. Alabama is a, a pretty um, well-studied case in law school, I think, at least it gets a mention, um, and um, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court ended up um, reasoning that, well, to briefly summarize it, um, basically it was a, a company owned town and except for the fact that it was owned by a company it had all the normal characteristics of a town that it had a deputy sheriff as its law enforcement officer. 
Or the sheriff arrested a Jehovah's Witness who had been distributing religious uh, literature. And the Jehovah's Witness raised a First Amendment defense, which should have prevailed if the town had been a public entity. Um, but the Alabama Appeals Court rejected it because it found, well, title to the sidewalk is in the corporation. Um, and whatever public use of the sidewalk there had been, the appeal court didn't think it supported a presumption that the sidewalk had been somehow dedicated irrevocably to the public. And the US Supreme Court reversed that and reasoned that, well, look, the more you open up your property for use by the public, the more the rights become circumscribed and the, um, the, the, the property rights become circumscribed by this, the constitutional rights of people using the property. And they said, um, this is where the language comes in. The, the court said, since these facilities are built and operated primarily to benefit the public, and since their operation is essentially a public function, it's subject to state regulation. Um, and as Stephen alluded to, there are some courts that have concluded that basically, if you've got a private security guard that's endowed with plenary police powers, um, such that they're de facto police officers, then that person might qualify that it would be a fact-based test. So I think you would want to look at, do the premier guards have authority to arrest? Do they have authority to carry weapons? They do carry weapons. Um, and where does that authority come from? Um, but then getting to the second part of that, if the, so if the better analogy between the premier guards and the empire is one of federal law enforcement um, that wouldn't directly line up with 1983 um, because of the color of state law requirement, right? So under 1983, you have to be acting under color of state law. And if you're acting under color of federal law, that doesn't put you under 1983, that might possibly put you under some other doctrines, um, but it wouldn't be 1983. And I think you'd have the same issue if you decided to classify them as um, you know, military contractors or in some way um, working with and on behalf of the military, you'd have that same problem. Well said and great analysis for uh, going after a company town for violating civil rights. Which brings us to Cassian once again killing a couple dudes. So <laughs> Did he murder those guards or was this a fair fight? Does it matter who started it? Who wants to go first? Because so I, so I think you have to look at both of them. You have to look at these two individually. I think you have a, a different set of circumstances uh, with the first and the second guard. Uh, with the first guard, he's being shaken down effectively. They've initiated what they deem to be a, effectively a, a, an arrest. He can't go anywhere. He's got a blaster to the back of his head. He's allegedly in violation of some company rules about ID and curfew requir requirements. He's, uh, they seem to have strategically decided to stop him in this area, partly because it's really secluded, but also... It seems to be within some bounds that civilians aren't supposed to be in this hour of night. And uh, so anyway, and then they al allude to a, a process that would ordinarily result in a fine, but then they put a blaster to the back of his head. Setting aside, so the self-defense type argument in, in that moment, uh, you know, when we think about the, the use of force in, in, uh, to defend yourself, there are some exceptions to, to when you cannot use that force, when you're not allowed to use that force. And one of those exceptions would be when a law enforcement officer, in this case, you know, a, a corporate authority, a corporate figure with the authority and color of, you know, law cloaking them as law enforcement officers, they're acting within the scope of their duties. And, you know, you can't pull a gun on a police officer who's lawfully stopped you at the side of the road and fire at the officer and claim self-defense somehow. That's not how that, that's not how anything works. Um, here, I think there's, there's a question about the legitimacy of this whole process, a big one. Uh, they cite a bunch of stuff. It's unclear. T to me, it looks like a complete shakedown. They're cooking something up to, to hassle him and get some credits out of him, make a quick score. Um, 
ultimately, I don't know whether that argument wins the day to allow Cassian to use self-defense, but at least in that first instance where he headbutts the uh, the first guard behind him, you could make an argument that he is in belief that his life is in danger. Uh, he's got a blaster against his head. It's reasonable for somebody to assume that guard is going to pull the trigger. And if he does, Cassian's going to be dead or severely injured. Um, he doesn't intend, it seems like, to use deadly force. He just hits him in a really particular way. And, uh, you know, so I think if if he could get around uh, that law enforcement portion of it, I think you would have a good cause to, to say, hey, I was acting in self-defense. Uh, it, the force that I used wasn't intended as deadly force. Certainly, it turned out that way. The second guard, I think, is a different story. I mean, that's a point blank shot to the head of a somebody who's not a threat to you, who's on their knees sort of begging for their life in not so many words. Yeah, the uh, second one's clearly murder. Uh, <laughs> there's there's no way around. <laughs> you know, he's trying to cook cook up a, a story for them to share. And <laughs> Cassian's solution is to shoot him in the face. Yeah. Uh, that's mm. murder. We, we, there's, <laughs> that, that'd be murder. That's it it tactically might have been the right thing to do since they had seen him but uh morally the wrong thing to do and and legally the wrong thing to do uh, bethany you look eager to add something oh it's when when thinking about premor i see them as a kind of private military contract or a private security contract, less law enforcement per se, because they have a level of jurisdiction, but it's around their assets and the empire's assets. So if I'm not actively, and it is a little confusing as to specifically where Cassian is, where they follow him to, where is that exactly? Is that within their jurisdiction? Is that near their jurisdiction? Is it near any of their assets specifically? I mean, it kind of just looks like an alley or a, or a path in the middle of not much interesting, like no material, no, no buildings, no people that need protecting from Primor. So in, in those shoes, if I were in Cassian's shoes, I would be really freaked out, not just because of who it is, but because of where it is, because then it's more of an off the reservation. Like imagine you had a military soldier <laughs> or a private military contractor like pull you over and pull out a gun and point it at you. The, how much more terrifying would that be than maybe a jumpy policeman? That would still be absolutely terrifying, but it's still more within like a local policeman's jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, so I would be like more fearful because military, paramilitary, even if they have a jurisdiction, they're more likely to have stricter rules of engagement, especially around civilian areas. Mm -hmm. And they just so, had beef. I think that's a great point. Like you, you, yeah. you have to analyze what's going on in his head. These are two guys that not two strangers that just accosted him. He just had a, a big argument that almost boiled over. Uh, in the brothel so that's that's an excellent point yeah and if you think think about it the the empire and the sith specifically have made deals with anyone from the shadow collective to black sun to the hut syndicate all the way to like cloud city which seems more like a legitimate corporation um and so <laughs> i i would not say that like the the empire is very clearly a fascist organization, fascist regime, and they essentially side with anyone that benefits them. And so if you are well-traveled or well-versed in imperial ways and in who lines up with the imperials, you're not gonna believe that these are law enforcing, law abiding people who are just doing their jobs necessarily. It's gonna depend on the individual. And in this case, they had beef for no reason. Mm -hmm. yeah, mention, they were, just, oh, they were just drinking at a brothel. They're clearly not like 
either they're yeah. clearly not on duty or they're not <laughs> holding to the letter of their job. I was gonna, if I rolled up in uniform <laughs> to an alcoholic establishment slash brothel, there's Thomas, how would you prosecute yeah. me on that? Like, I, well, you'd be you'd be coming to see me in my defense capacity as a defense attorney. Yeah. <laughs> And, and few, some of the few prohibitions that exist in Nevada with brothels, again, this was on case tax, there are rules about where a brothel can be in relation to a military base. So just as we don't want cops drinking on the job, the idea of a couple military police officers getting drunk at a brothel on duty is bad there's there's and then to, i'm going to follow this guy into a back alley and do a shakedown to collect his fine directly from him there there's no legitimate way to think that they're uh, conducting law enforcement in a lawful manner you know that yeah. said you don't get to shoot at cops like we have laws like we don't we can't have things deteriorate uh, to that extreme. So you have to draw a line somewhere. But this is clearly corrupt. There's a reason why a rebellion's starting. So it's it's all bad. It's all I bad. was gonna add, although I agree the self-defense for officer number two is very weak, especially if you just look at the bare bones of that immediate situation. Um, I would question like who are your juries? who are your jurors here? Like if you have more Lana one jurors who've had a lot of negative experiences with these Primor guards, they may actually be inclined to believe that Cassian at least had a genuine good faith belief that he was in danger. So maybe imperfect self-defense or um, something along those lines. Although I actually think imperfect self-defense is still kind of a hard sell um, because looking at what he actually did, he, he, seems to have made more of a tactical decision but um but hey you know your I, jury pool is these morlana one people maybe maybe it'll work yeah. out yeah and I, the, look there is something to be said when when it comes to to you know trial presentation right a self-defense claim in which the person claiming self-defense is the only one left to speak and and i'm assuming there's no sec security cam or hollow cam footage or anything like that you know, he can kind of craft things, right? Like you can't put him up there as an attorney and, and you know, knowingly allow him to perjure himself. But I look at the the recent Kyle Rittenhouse trial, right? Like you didn't have, you had one person's account describing how he felt allegedly under, under the circumstances, but at least for a couple of the individuals that were killed, they weren't there to, to say their piece. And, and likewise, Cassian, uh, you know, his attorney knows what he tells him, right? And, you know, take it from me, clients don't always tell you the truth, even though you have uh, the the uh, the cloak of attorney-client privilege uh, and, and you're there to help them. But, um, yeah. I, I, clients lie? What? <laughs> Who? Yeah, so weird. sorry, Stephen. I hate to break that it's, to you. I remember the first time it happened to me, I was like, what? And it was, like, completely nonsensical. But anyway, it, like, broke my reality for a minute. But... Anyways, and then the sentence. Sad to say that in. happens to me so often. I don't remember the first time it happened to me. Yeah. Uh, civil litigation. So. Yeah. But uh, no, I mean, you know, Cassian's a smart person. If he found himself on trial, you don't know. And then, you know, Bethany makes a great set of points about like how you have to dig into things. It's not a fight. Like, well, he had a, a blaster bolt in the middle of his forehead. So therefore you murdered him. It's It's more complex than that. You got to look at. Uh, the totality of the circumstances. Well, well, it, it's it's um throughout history, even modern history, the further you get away from whatever you would want to call the center of an organization or government or country, the uh, more loose people tend to follow the rules. Um, like I remember first joining. And it looked like there might possibly be a chance for me to deploy uh, pre-leaving Afghanistan. And one of my uh, mentors who'd been in the service and deployed multiple times, one of his main pieces of advice was never leave the wire without a crew you trust no matter what. 
um, because they could lead you over landmines. They could sell you to the locals. Like he listed these things that had happened and the, and it was just like, yeah, he was like, you will find groups of people who are following all of the ROEs who are doing their due diligence and you'll find people who have gone really far off the reservation because they can or because they felt forced to whether that is or is not the case like there's not really any justification for some actions um but yeah you have this case of like the cassian is this is not coruscant this is not the height of imperial order and rule of of imperial law this is shady mid-rim areas where you you really don't know what's going to happen uh which also could be the pre-war officer's justification for pulling a weapon because they could be like hey like we are in unfriendly territory or we were scared you know they could make some of those arguments too if, if they were still alive that is but they're not so you gotta be careful when you're withdrawing from your human atm <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's the nicest way i've ever heard put robbing someone <laughs> <laughs> just remember that for your next closing all right, all right. so cassian has uh some imperial hardware that he wants to sell is he i i think the question is why is he guilty of theft not is how is he guilty of theft who wants to address this Whoever added it to the outline, go. I mean, allegedly, right? He's yeah, well, alleged. No, well, well, I the, the funny thing about all of it is that he you have probably the most powerful piece of evidence, at least in our court system, which is the defendant's statements. And he admits to having taken it. Uh we we get some throughout the the uh, second and third episode, really the third episode from Luthen, background on just how secure this item is. It's clear from from his conversations with Bix and whatnot that this is not just a highly sensitive piece of uh, military hardware, uh, but it's very valuable. Like the value implies uh, its its rarity or its um, uh, difficulty to obtain. And then Luthen colors that in with, you know, this is under steer guard, right? This is a, a highly, would have been from a highly secured area. And he, it, after being paid an extra thousand bucks, <laughs> admits to, uh, you know, effectively just going in, uh, pretending to be an Imperial soldier or officer and, and just taking it. And uh, so, so the idea here uh, with with theft or with larceny is you, you're you've got a, a piece of property that's not yours you're taking it you've got to move it away that doesn't require you to move it light years away from the source it can be you know a few feet but you've got an intent piece so that's the action you've got an intent piece that you uh you understand that it's not yours and you intend uh to keep it to to keep it from the rightful owner permanently uh there's a difference between larceny obviously and what they call wrongful appropriation, something, you know, more, a more temporary taking. It is absolutely clear that Cassian did both of those things. He meets both the, the core elements of a larceny. He, he went in with intent to steal. He knew it wasn't his, it's, it's Imperial property. It's just the way it's described like crystal. It was like the most star Wars name and description for an item I've ever heard. It was like crystals and what it's probably like each of those components probably now has a Wikipedia, Wikipedia page, but it's absolutely clear this isn't like an off the shelf, you know, food processor. Um, it's military technology. It's not his. He has taken it um, to Ferrix and he's selling it, uh, you know, proof positive. If, if Luthen were an undercover officer, proof positive that uh, you're not intending to give it back or, or, hey, this mistakenly ended up in my luggage uh, as I was infiltrating your base doing other things. As it, it's like John Walker level material for, it's not tracking submarines, it's a, tracking the Imperial fleet within like what, nine parsecs, something huge. Right. Yeah, so there's a- Any any Imperial ship, yeah. Yeah, there's a, 
that'd be bad. Uh, I raised the question, and I think the answer is going to be no, is, is Ferrex OSHA compliant? And I don't think so. There's, well, there's gloves. I didn't see a lot of eyewear protection. Not everyone had uh, hearing protection, perhaps maybe besides Mr. Gong. Uh, but, you know, there's, other than that, they, there seems to be some uh, areas of improvement that an OSHA inspector would identify if inspecting that very libertarian town. I don't care what the I guy's say, actual name is. Mr. Gong is now his canonical name. It's perfect. Also, can I just say that I love how enthusiastic he was? He's just like, yes. like posing and excited. And it was like he had his own like dance before every like single type of gonging <laughs> event. It was incredible. They I love him. <laughs> yeah. But uh, just to point out, because it is one of my friend's uh, pet peeves with Star Wars, Mr. Gong has safety railings around him. This is true. Not everyone in Star Wars. In fact, no one else in Star Wars ever does. But I bet that was Mr. Gong's doing because he seems like the type to just be like, I will be compliant with all rules and regulations. I'm investing in myself here. <laughs> I mean, he might have got the job because the prior guy fell out. So he went, no, no, I'm the first thing I'm doing is putting in some railing there will be no trip hazards here so none of that it, it also looks pre-imperial so so back in the yeah, day they moved in yet and removed the railings <laughs> these what are, are these doing here cut them out these this are is what out. happens when you watch a new hope with a friend who's a an interest in osha law and every time they power up the <laughs> weapon whoop, those guys would have a safety railing come on man <laughs> waxed floors and uh, slick boots. Yeah, bad, bad all around. All right, well, let's get into episode two. That would be me. And what is uh, Marva's re legal relationship with Cassian? And there's a lot here, whether it's war orphan, because there's a category there. And since this is clearly latter half of the Clone Wars, that he looks like a war orphan. There are other categories it could be as well because we're not really cool with just picking a kid up. But he is an orphan. So I, I think it's important to, to draw that line of everybody's dead and he's going to get shot. So let's talk about truly, uh, this is the most extreme found family that we have in Star Wars right now. Uh, who wants to take this this unique view of uh, creating a parental relationship. Bueller. It seems, um, it seems unclear. Like you said, there, there's orphans. It seems unclear, like what the family structure is with the other children, um, that if there's someone who would assert custodial rights, um, for CASA, um, and if not, then I don't know, there's obviously no such thing as like a found property for children like that doesn't exist. So um, it's it seems weird to me, although we don't we don't know yet. We haven't seen because we've just seen him kind of wake up on the ship. Obviously, he's been kidnapped, but at some point he might have sort of voluntarily agree to go with them. Um, we haven't seen that yet, but um, he has been certainly kidnapped um, at that point because he's been um, taken without his consent, obviously. And sedated. Sedated, not good. I mean, the other, to, um, they, they did do it to kind of ostensibly rescue him from the situation where they were, someone was going to find him and hurt him. Um, so there might be sort of a lesser evil situation there, but I'm not sure what that would be. Tough yeah, call. it's a tough call because it's one thing to go, uh, we haven't seen all the facts yet. Because if the issue is, I don't want to leave him here so I have a necessity defense of I'm taking the child, I'm kidnapping the child because I don't want the child to get killed by the Republic. So was there an intent to try to find the kid's family as opposed to I'm your mom now? Like, so there, that's a huge difference because if the issue then is like, we have this community of kids and all the parents are gone, what happened? Yeah, I found that whole thing profoundly disturbing um, between the, I mean, she she sedates him, she takes him over the objections of her companion who's there with her. And I mean, it's fair enough to say that, well, in the immediate sense, there may have been 
some kind of emergency and um, they had to get him out of there because it's very possible that she's right. He, you know, there's a Republic ship of some kind coming and, um, you know, all of them may be at risk. But um, once that emergency passes, I feel like then, then what is this person's obligation? I think that kind of calls back to your issue that you put in the latter part of the outline um, about the Indian Child Welfare Act, which I think I think you were right to flag that because there's just something so uncomfortable about this whole scene. Like they don't, they, they can't understand each other. They just sort of take him. Um, and then once the emergency passes, it doesn't seem like they, they do anything to try to reunite him at all. Um, and, you know, although it, you know, it's true, there's seemingly no adults left on the planet. That's not really explained um, why not. You kind of see this abandoned um, and, partially destroyed looking area that makes you think, well, okay, maybe, maybe there was some kind of mining incident on this, or, or maybe that's just some made up cover story. And that's not what actually happened, because it is curious that there's this community of children and, and sort of preteens on the planet, and no adults, there's only no adults, but there's lots of children. So how did it happen exactly that all the adults are gone, but there's still children and is there anybody that could possibly take custody of him that would be from his own community I, I feel like that was just a, a very morally ambiguous and problematic act by Marva. Marva and her companion seem to to know more about the overall situation even even beyond hey there's a Republic Corvette that just arrived in orbit uh, they come in wearing masks and and they are clearly using B to scan for some sort of toxin. Uh, and, and I think that's, <laughs> that awareness is built more than just like, hey, they, they look to be uh, crew uh, crew that had masks on and maybe got poisoned or something like that. They are expecting something. That uh, that destruction you mentioned, that's a that's a great eye because that's, that, that's more than just like a small mining operation. That was like, that planet is being stripped to its core effectively. And if you look closely, like if, if you looked at the uniforms of the, the, um, the crash ship personnel, they're wearing the badge of the separatists, but they're all of the descriptions in the conversation that, that Marva has is about the Republic coming in and immediately going guns out to kill anyone that's there. It's a very curious juxtaposition. I think we're going to probably find out more about it, but they seem to, to have confidence that death or serious bodily injury was imminent for not just them, but for, for CASA as well. And so they acted with, you know, with, with that certainty in mind. So I think there's, there's a yeah. powerful argument that they have that whatever the nature of this operation, the crash was, it, it put him at, at near certain risk of, of death. And I wonder how big is the planet? Because is it the size of Piedmont? And that's why you see, you know, 24 kids running around, or is it the size of Earth where we have around 7 billion people running around? So just because there's a mining accident in Utah doesn't mean that we abandoned the entire planet unless it was something really, really bad. So, so I got the sense in the three episodes that Cassian was a sole survivor type. Like I got the sense that he was somehow one of the last known survivors of Canari, and that that's one reason why they completely changed, uh, like where he was born, uh, not because of shit that he got into, uh, excuse the language, uh, but because because uh, he's like constantly getting into trouble. But she seems to have changed. Uh, where he was born much earlier like that seems to be something that's been a thing for some time is for no he's born on fest he's born on fest like that seems to be their ongoing historical story so if there was something going on planet-wide uh, maybe with a separatist in some way I think Marva could almost say that she was saving him from genocidal level action um but we we don't really know per se that was just the sense that i got was that poor cassian has had to start over multiple times 
well said because the building a fleet, whether it's the separatist fleet or the Republic fleet is gonna take a lot of raw materials. So there's probably lots of planets carved up if you're building aircraft carrier size spaceships all the time. Like there's a lot of resources that go into this. So this isn't Death Star construction. Uh, it's a little I, early for that, unless I think it. I think it is Death Star construction I, because think about the reason. What well, a the Death Star was under construction at this point. By uh, canonically, the, the Sith. yeah, yeah, yeah. Canonically, it was under construction, but but also think about the circumstances that would have demanded uh, wiping out a planet. Like the the Star Wars is nothing if not like great at, at like drumming on the the same drum and like mining disaster is like the most common cover story for a Death Star related thing. And I think about operational security and the the reasons the Empire has sort of repeatedly gone back to the the um, well of like wiping out large groups of people. And and there's a a direct parallel or, or intersection points between Death Star construction and secrecy of that project and uh you know mass destruction of a world or its people um you know repeatedly throughout uh sort of the the early days like that i go to the the rogue one lead-in novel catalyst and the empire was like ravaging worlds and and you know putting people under the boot heel and killing them uh for for some of the the uh materials it would make sense that they were that they would do so here um and I just think about the reason, you know, they wouldn't wipe out a people because they needed resources for Star Destroyers. Everybody gets that they need to build Star Destroyers and, you know, a world might get wrecked in the process, but they would need to silence people to keep the lid on a massive secret project like the Death Star. So that speculation, but that's that's just my thought on it. It's, it's possible. And the fact that there's, you know, the Imperials say that there was some environmental disaster raises the issue of who caused it. Even if it was the time of the Republic, the Empire is the successor in interest to that government. So they would be the ones to designate it. But Which it's would a, also put any survivors of Canari at mm -hmm. risk merely just because they survived. Yeah, you yeah. saw something. Yeah, so there's, again, things to unpack. All of that said, I wouldn't be surprised if that Republic cruiser shot down the Separatist ship, and that's how why it crashed, and thus they're going for cleanup. Uh, Star Wars false flag. Yeah. And, <laughs> I hate to use that term. Bad man. Uh, it also <laughs> raises the issue of, uh, uh, isn't Marva a Separatist? So because we might see clone troops going through town and another flashback. So there's, uh, again, just questions that we don't have answers to yet, uh, but we're going to find out. So, all right, other issues, and we should probably start picking up. We have uh, corporate authority and reach, and with the uh, deciding to issue a warrant and go chase down Cassian. Uh, it's a jurisdictional question. So it's in the fact that they actually mention a warrant that implies there's a judge, unless it's a weird administrative warrant, like the type that you would have for uh, trying to get phone records, which again is a scary, weird thing. But like, those are the types of things that have happened. Next up, we also have uh, the issue of uh, inflation and the price of space travel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my favorite that issue in. that we've discussed yeah <laughs> gas prices just go up it's all that are coming down now yeah. this just made me laugh when i was watching the the second episode and cassian is negotiating with the guy to fly him off planet between 900 and 700 credits and i'm thinking wow in like five years luke and ben are going to be negotiating with han solo for like <laughs> 10 times that amount <laughs> or not 10 times but 10,000 credits more than that yeah, well, again, there's different part of the galaxy. Distance could be a thing. You know, there. It just struck me as you know, funny how similar the negotiations were. What's the hire the Don't Millennium ask questions. <laughs> yeah, but when you hire the Millennium Falcon, that comes with a premium. It's like sure. uh, getting the top end Uber. It's the right? ship that and made the Kessel Run in less than twelve parsecs. <laughs> or exactly. the 
the virgin cruise ship that says no kids allowed it's like oh okay so this is not the disney cruise noted uh, it also it also might be just that the the noose of the empire has tightened so much that making riskier flights like that the the, the, the premium of not asking any questions or saying anything was just like the difference of 200 credits but by a new hope they're so secure the security is so tight that it goes up that much it's interesting yeah we might see that it's a little easier for cassian to slip away than it is for luke and han and ben it's a great observation i love han you know desperation is a factor in negotiations too and i love han's line like these guys must be desperate (laughs) and so they just juice them for all their you know (laughs) Luke's poor land speeder has to go up for sale. It raises other questions about um, where we are in time. I love the idea of that there's a larger imperial presence. Uh, We also, this is a free enterprise zone opposed to the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, scum and villainy hive. Uh, of Mos Eisley. So it's it's a very different setup uh, as well. So that could be a factor of, you know, it's easier to book a flight from like San Jose to Salt Lake, as opposed to like some small regional airport, like getting to Palm Springs, California from the Bay Area is a pain in the neck. However, if you're going to a hub, like again, Vegas, Salt Lake, Chicago, uh, fares tend to be better. So there, there could have been a factor there that maybe Alderaan was just really hard to get to. Uh, or, you know, like going to celebration in London, it's going to cost more if you if you are going. So, which brings us to a reckoning. All right. Not the right way to serve an arrest warrant. For those who have done either criminal defense or prosecution, why don't one of you take this on for how this is a bad plan? So let's we'll start with the basics. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna be a law enforcement officer, and I suppose we'll accept for the moment that the Primor guys are, you have to actually get a warrant which is a whole process of proving that you have probable cause to search a place for a thing that you, you know, you have probable cause to believe a crime was committed and that the thing you are searching for is going to be found where you want to search for it. You have to take that to a judge and convince the judge and have the judge sign the warrant. So it's not just, Hey, let's go toss this old lady's house and say, Oh, we have a warrant to do it. It's okay. Which brings me to the second point. You do have to like show them the warrant and tell them, hey, we have a warrant and there's a process of executing the warrant, which does not include like searching through all of her drawers and tearing her house apart to look for a person. If you're going to look for a person, you can look and you have the actual warrant. You had probable cause and the judge signed it and said, you can go look in this place for this person, which carries its own rules that I think is, I don't think we need to get into that. But if you, if you have that ability to go look for that person, you can look in a place where the person could be. You can't look in like her chest of drawers where she's keeping all of her clothes. Cassian's not hiding in a one foot by two foot drawer. So no, that's that's not how you do that. They it very are... much. In, oh, go ahead, Josh. No, no, you first. You first. It very much. It reminded me, and and it's okay if I get crucified for making this comparison because I it I've, I've come to love this this particular story. It reminded me of the search that happens in the original Star Wars holiday special, where these stormtroopers just like roll up on they roll Chewbacca's house. They rip apart his poor Lumpy's uh, bedroom and like tear the head off of his Bantha doll. Not Lumpy's bedroom. I know. They just, (laughs) they ruin everything. But uh, yeah, I question whether they even went through the process to get, even if Primor has a process for a warrant, it very much seemed like this entire crew led by Cyril was 
done with urgency and with with sort of a uh, a premium on on keeping it quiet because he was acting very much against the, the authority of his superior as uh, as by the book of guys he seems to be he seemed to be driven by idealism in this instance not so much checking all the boxes and yeah you know, he didn't even bother I, I think about training day with Denzel where they roll up and throw a like flash a Chinese food menu and pretend that that's a warrant. He didn't even bother like flashing a garbage piece of paper. They just go in and, and toss the place. Um, and it's not, yeah, I think about the, the force with which they rolled in. It's not illegal or uncommon for law enforcement to take, you know, serious precautions in the serving of a warrant. Certainly, um, you know, there are any number of, of violent situations that happen every single day when warrants are being executed. Um, and, and they specifically train for, for that sort of thing, uh, to, to prepare for it. He's, Andrew's a, uh, a wanted violent, violent criminal. So it makes sense that they would bring force in, but they kind of like quickly escalate things to like kill him first. And we'll worry about everything else later when we do the paperwork. I not doing criminal law, I did think about the probable cause requirement. And part of the idea on Andor came from the uh, uh, Madam from the Brothel, which is not supposed to be operating. So her entire contribution to the affidavit for you know for the application is problematic at best because it subjects her to criminal liability no matter what, even if there's some immunity for this, that could shut down her establishment. So it's just, it's it's a very problematic position to be in because uh, they need that testimony in order to get the warrant. But at what cost does that you know, follow? Do, do they so even, are, so, well, go ahead. I just say there are rules around when you can use confidential sources and you don't have to disclose that it's, you know, it's the madam of the brothel that he was at. There are so there are some rules about that. If this were real world police, they could conceivably keep her identity concealed. They would have to say, you know, she provided this information either freely, but there could be legal consequences to it, or she provided it in exchange for promises of leniency in another case she would also have had to provide reliable information in the past is another big um, thing that they use but that's you know if you're the proprietor of a brothel that's got a questionable relationship with the local law enforcement it's not impossible that she's given reliable information to the police before that's on the menu information is on the menu i wonder and this is a question for the group but whether they even have probable cause because the more i think about it the the only real uh, evidence connecting the three is just this uh, statement from the brothel that the three of them were together, maybe some relation of the the argument that they had, but it didn't get close to being physical in there. Um, it it literally is the only person that that they can really intersect uh, with with these two before their death. But there's nothing beyond that, at least maybe I missed something, but there's nothing beyond that to connect the three and put them in the same place or anything like that. So I wonder whether they would even meet probable cause to get a warrant in the first place. Yeah, it's pretty thin. I mean, I think they 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 base their assumption that, that there's some sketchiness in the records that connects him and that makes him yeah. more suspicious just because he's lying about who he is. But all of this is very like, the theatrics of process. It's all very results driven. Um, it's there's mm -hmm. definitely Cyril's gonna find someone in the time before his boss gets back. And it doesn't really matter who it is, as long as he has a head to throw on the desk. And it's, it's very theatrical. It's very sort of um, there for the, the, uh, the process appear appearance of process, but I think it's all very thin. <laughs> I think, yeah, even if they could add up all the scraps and combine it to somehow come up with 
Pavel, because I'm really curious to hear what the explanation for this is going to be when the chief inspector gets back, even assuming that they do have probable cause, right? Um, I mean, it's in contravention of his direct order, albeit his direct order arguably also facially invalid because he pretty much told him to go ahead and falsify a report, which isn't good. Um, so, but that aside, I mean, the, the, the consequence of the insubordination is so much more extreme than, you know, the consequence of falsifying a report. I mean, he started off with two dead colleagues and when he's done after this whole debacle is over, there's more, at least two more fatalities, numerous injuries, and and um, Cyril looks shell shocked at the end of it. And you really so are gratifying. What is, yeah, what is he going to say to the chief inspector? Or is there something going on in the background we don't know about? How did he get this warrant? Um, yeah, so many questions. His, his nicely the chief tailored inspector uniform wasn't is all. I know it's all creased and rumpled. <laughs> Well, so, so actually a question uh, about, let's say that probable cause is good. They do have a warrant um, in, in not finding Cassian at the house. Uh, would it be legal for them to search the house, like search her drawers, for example, for evidence of where Cassian might be? It depends on what they get in the warrant. Because yeah. if... It has to the be warrant has to be particular for what they're looking for, and they have to have a reason to believe that what they're looking for is where they think it is. So, you know, if they say, well, this person has been known to harbor Cassian Andor, let's say Cassian has a passport registered on the planet, and they know that passports are regularly kept in personal property and that Cassian has a room in this house where he keeps his stuff. It's conceivable that they could put together a warrant that's particular enough to let them search like Cassian's room for a passport, for means of flight, for the weapon that he used to shoot the guards or things like that. But they do have to be pretty specific for these things. So they can't just say, we want to search her house because we think he lives there and we think we might find something there. So we're going to tear her house apart and it'll be great. Uh, you, you don't get to do that. Yeah, there's a, you know, there's almost a double entendre to reckoning. Whose reckoning are we seeing? Because I think it's both Cassian and our aspiring, you know, deputy who gets a face full of, I did not plan for this to happen. So there's, uh, I don't know, two to six guys dead in trying to execute this warrant one crash ship and you do have a town in open rebellion now so good job on the tuesday when the boss is out of town so that won't re that won't have a negative performance review so all all bad uh come on josh the I, I had a question for the example of failing upward <laughs> this is true you yeah, have the entire imperial navy is <laughs> it could model for that. I had a question for Bethany. This is uh, not strictly legal, but your opinion on how closely they nailed sort of the stereotypical archetype of a young, very, very eager, perhaps over eager. I was officer. having so many flashbacks. <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh, I've worked with at least three of these people. <laughs> three cycles. <laughs> yeah. It's Sometimes they calm down, usually after making mistakes, not Thank as cool. bad as in the show, but yeah, it, it kind of depends a lot on how specific personality types tend to take initial military training. So whether it's boot camp or the academies or um, OTS, those sources of joining the military tend to be a, we will stress test you by yelling and screaming, making you do pull up push-ups, marching everywhere, following every order. You have a specific way you can eat. And so if that's your first encounter with military leadership and you emulate that in the field, it, it doesn't work. Like, it, and there's a lot of um, soul searching going on within the military right now as to 
how to appropriately train people entering the service, both to do their actual day job, as well as to be able to deploy and what that looks like, because those two things are very, very different. Like Cassian right now is making an excellent spy. Like he is showing a ton of qualifications for very specific jobs within the rebellion. Don't think he would make a great like division <laughs> commander in a peacetime scenario type personality. So it's it's a the introduction of military training for a very specific type of personality who takes that as a this is what military leadership is kind of some of them turn into cyrals and have to find out the hard way that that's that's not how life and work works outside and, outside of very specific training environments yeah, so. very well said i there's a direct line connection because of how the military functions to this litany of legal issues that he's created because at least in the U.S. military, commanders carry a lot of legal authority on their shoulders, uh, criminal authority, yeah. authority to bring charges, to put folks in, in uh, you know, pretrial confinement before their, their cases, um, you know, authority to, to pursue something like a warrant or to, to uh, use force. It, it's, it's quite a lot and, and something that's really not replicated at all in, in at least an individual person um on the civilian side and yeah. so there are a lot of, that personality complex and and how they they view themselves and all of those things that bethany was pointing out those have direct line connections to the decisions that they'll make that carry legal consequences good and bad mm -hmm. yeah in cyril's you can, case very bad yeah uh on a positive side you can see a commander use that significant amount of power to do something good quickly. Let's say that there is uh, something horrible happens, like there's a, an accusation of a sexual assault. A commander has a lot of power to be able to forcibly separate uh, people at work the, really quickly. Um, they can move military members to other bases, to other states if they want. Um, they, they have a lot of power that can be used for good if you have someone who hasn't had a lot of experience or, or doesn't have good judgment, which does happen, then that power is, is really warped. And if left to run unchecked, looks like what is happening with Cyril. Yeah, the manager's gone and he decides to go full great dictator we're going seeking out um justice good job buddy good nail that speech so you have a moron in charge who's really excited to go out and do his job and he gets a bunch of people killed in the process so it's not a good day at work so it's his reckoning uh but we also get issues with the flashbacks that are happening simultaneously. And I have to say, I liked this flashback use more than I did in Book of Boba Fett because they did a good job of paralleling what was happening. And the, you know, the last part of episode three is masterful with how they show what they're doing. So uh, well done there. But with the crashed ship that happens, and a boarding party going aboard is problematic because this is not a derelict vessel. It's a crashed vessel. It's something that is lost, but if it belongs to a government, like a warship, that stays the possession of that nation state. So it's not like you just found a lifeboat that's adrift. That's a different situation. Or if you do have a ghost ship situation where you get into salvage rights, this thing's crashed. There are still warm bodies on it. And the people who probably shot it down are on the way and they're in a state of war with the, the separatist government. So there's huge problems with going aboard uh, to, to plunder it. 
uh, but that's just me getting to nerd out about sailor stuff. Uh, we do have the uncomfortable issues with taking a child that we've addressed in detail, and I don't think we need to get into that more other than I hope they try to return him. So that would make this way less awkward later. I just uh, did one circle over it, like, no, 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 they're all gone. You're yeah, coming well, with us. It's, <laughs> they went back later. It's He's not a puppy. Like, this isn't... <laughs> Was Cass a microchip, though? You have to ask that question. Did you check? Does he have his collar on? I don't know. Yeah, no. <laughs> Human being. So again, very, very different situation of it's not a rainy day and the puppy outside and you you adopt the puppy. It's a person. It's like, where are your parents? What's happened here? So very uncomfortable. Now, we then get to Luthen who clouded in mystery. So we don't know a bunch about him. Is he a former Senator? How much cash does he carry on him? What's his funding source? So there's all kinds of issues around, around him, but he's there to buy stolen property. That's a crime. And when you're, again, there's this line in the stand that I, I hope our law of war expert can offer here where when does this turn into a legitimate armed conflict as opposed to is he just committing treason against the empire right now? And we might have I mean, already passed that line. <laughs> so, no, I, the, I, so we'll assume for sake of argument that the um, pre war security force is acting with state authorities. So there, it's as if. There might as well have been stormtroopers there, right? It's as if the state were acting. And there's no there's no temporal or intensity requirement for an international armed conflict. So a conflict between states, it could be like a single bullet and you've got an arm, a, a single bullet gets fired across and you have uh, an armed conflict tri that, that triggers the, the sort of full uh, full array of law of war protections. This is not that though. Uh, you know, I don't, it doesn't appear that Luthen is at least out from the minimal we know about him. He's not acting as, under the flag of a, a state. Cassian certainly isn't. Um, these are more, they're, we'll, we'll just affiliate them both with the rebellion. That's a non state armed group, something like, um, yeah, I'm not equating them philosophically with any of them, but like the Taliban or like insurgent forces in Iraq or Syria. Uh, in other words, forces that are not the government. They are not aligned with the government. They are uh, out there doing their own thing. And in those cases, uh, you do have uh, requirements to get you up to the level of an armed conflict, namely uh, you have to reach a certain level of intensity because uh, you don't want flare ups, things like internal riots or civil war, uh, certain types of civil disruptions rather uh, don't rise to the level to, to uh, you know, trigger an armed conflict and, and bring in those those IHL protections. This, even though the, that firefight was very intense and there's a chase and, and everything and it was great Star Wars, doesn't meet the, the legal test under Geneva Convention's um, additional protocol two and, and the, the sort of progeny of law that's that's gone on. You're, you're gonna need a more sustained conflict. I would, I would say, you look at the, the galactic civil war as a whole, easy to make that argument that it, it meets that definition and triggers those legal protections, but that's not in play here. And, and that's really critical for both Luthen and Cassian not as the circumstances wound out, they escape and, and you know, the series continues. But had they gotten captured uh, and you you haven't tripped the, the uh, you know, existence of IHL, right? You don't have an armed conflict and those legal protections aren't in place. Well, as a detainee, as a prisoner of war, whatever your status is, you don't have any of those protections under international law. You're just you're just detained, right? You're, you're no different than any other prisoner uh, that's captured in the context of a law enforcement operation or a riot or something like that. And that can be very, that, that can mean a vastly different set of circumstances 
uh, for those that are behind bars. And that's just one example of, of those protections. Also, uh, they don't have combatant immunity. It's so, so by that, I mean, uh, in an armed conflict, in a legitimate armed conflict, the things that you do that are part of carrying out a war, killing people and that sort of thing, you, you can't be prosecuted for, for, for sort of lawfully carrying out a war, uh, even the, the really unsavory and tragic parts of it. That's, that protection exists within the bounds of IHL, within the bounds of an armed conflict. If it's not tripped and you're killing people uh, in the context of a firefight like that, as, as we saw some of those pre-war guards fell uh, or were exploded uh, <laughs> gloriously in a, uh, in a uh, classic Star Wars ambush, there's criminal uh, liability that attaches there. Uh, that, that's not, you, don't, you can't just chalk it up to, well, it's a war and those were the enemy. Um, that, that legal framework's not in operation. So you you suddenly find that they're they're creating in the course of like 15 minutes, like this like daisy chain of legal issues and legal liabilities for themselves. And on that note, looking at the entire town, when they start banging the chimes, are they all engaged in obstruction of justice at that point in time <laughs> and christine this seems like something you would just <laughs> well i didn't embrace. i didn't think of it that way when i heard it um i mean it was very it was a really interesting feature of um that whole scenario right and it it seemed like they all knew what it meant the viewer doesn't necessarily know what it means they kind of gain some insight through what Marva says about it, that when it stops, um, but you're not quite sure as you're watching it, what, what does she mean? Like when it stops, like, I mean, she can't possibly know what's going on with Lufin and um, Cassian. So, um, so I'm not honestly sure what to make of that. I, I definitely wouldn't, um, you know, at face, at face value, I would just look at it as this is some type of, you know, warning mechanism, I wouldn't necessarily attribute um, it, it to, to go so far as to obstruct justice. I don't know, what, what do others think about that? Just making it's nice so music. Yeah. Ambiance. Yeah. yeah. It's a community <laughs> music event. It, it just struck me as, as being, like you said, Christine, it's very, um, it struck me as people warning the community that there's danger and it's time to lock down and to move indoors and to avoid um, the streets. Um, it didn't strike me that there was a, an immediate plan to interfere with law enforcement or investigation or anything, but interesting. Right. We'll find out. Yeah. Right. I mean, if nothing else for your own personal safety, you should know that there's people coming through and, you know, they have weapons and you should not be there when their weapons are heading your way. I think his name's Brasso, which makes me think of polishing brass. He does play crack the whip with that shuttle pod and in attaching a giant anchor to it. And you have a very inexperienced pilot who doesn't know to look behind him to make sure that he's clear or not uh, fouled on something. Mm -hmm. So- Right, yeah. somebody, somebody sabotages him. I didn't catch that it was him, but yeah, so there, Maybe some individuals uh, may have engaged in some acts that uh, weren't exactly um, above board. Yeah. Which when you then blow up a shuttle like that, I'm going to assume obstruction of justice is the least of your charges. <laughs> <laughs> it seems yes. like one of those things where it's like, yeah, yeah, we'll settle for the obstruction of justice. You just <laughs> dump the rest of that. We're good. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll ignore the homicide. So maybe manslaughter at least. Yeah, so there's a... We call that bad. Call that bad. Uh, let's talk about Tim. Like I, I'm not going to start spelling Joshua with two A's, but you know we can. <laughs> Tim, you know he, he's the rat. He decides I, I want my girlfriend to not think about her ex, so I'll call the police. Which is, how did he think this would end well? Who among us, though? who has felt threatened romantically has not called the authorities <laughs> not it so yeah it's uh uh yeah so there's a <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there but uh 
he startles law enforcement. He keeps coming at them after they tell him to stand down. And he gets shot. Now, that's the kid who gets sent back to the shuttle pod because his commanding officer is not happy he just shot an unarmed civilian. So <laughs> there does seem to be consequences here of give me your gun and you're going home now. But is uh, Tim's death justified by the uh, know, officer that, that pulled the trigger? I've never heard of any type of ROE that allows for shooting someone running at you if they're still unarmed, especially if you're in force and two or three of you could just restrain him. Yeah. So, yeah. And I does will he have, have stun. <laughs> like, what, yeah. Why the, if the weapon has a stun setting, why go right to lethal force? I will say I've seen cases of officer involved shootings where. They are very, very similar fact patterns to this. And the officer says something to the effect of, well, I was I was afraid for my safety. And so I had to shoot him. And I've seen a couple of those cases, some prosecuted, most not. Um, but I think if you just if you take the uh, the kind of politic out of it, no shooting someone who's unarmed is is not justified especially if you have less than lethal options and especially if the guy was i mean i don't remember anything in his approach to the officers that's particularly threatening to them and i suppose we'll use the term officers loosely but he's just kind of walking up to them they can see both his hands he's not armed he's not shouting at them as i recall or making he seems to be like running towards her like not actually right. at the officers yeah. he's like running towards her because he's like she's bleeding and then yeah it's tough to say this is a he's or, yeah a lawful use of force uh but the i was afraid uh it has been used many times in police shooting cases so Take that as you will. Yeah. So that's a that's a lot for three episodes, and the fact that we did this in you know in ninety minutes is uh, rare, and uh, that we covered so much in a timely fashion. Round robin, lightning speed. Let's just get any hopes and the expectations that we might have. So going across the top of my Zoom bar, Stephen. Your wish list. I can't wait for Coruscant and Mon Mothma. I'm so hoping they show up this week. <laughs> um, I love the design. I'm looking forward to that. Christine. That's right, Mon Mothma. <laughs> um, I'm trying to uh, temper my, my expectations um, and, and my hopes. Um, I, am, I am really excited to see how it develops. I, I do hope we get some answers to some of the questions that we raised during our talk today, um, but we'll see. Bethany. I'm very interested, interested to see more of the beginning stages of the rebellion. I mean, I guess the rebellion is underway, but we're bridging the gap between like A New Hope or even Rogue One uh, to hopefully see some more of what Padme, Bale, and Mon Mothma were setting up in Revenge of the Sith. So I'm really excited to see more, hopefully, of that storyline. Uh, and then just to get kind of more of the spy espionage side of Cassian is my hope that we get a little bit of a, a James Bond spy feel, if you will, from the series. Thomas. Well, Stephen and Christine committed larceny of my biggest, outside of seeing a Y-Wing on screen as part of the nascent rebellion. Uh, very, very uh, interested to see that this political lean to it centered on Mon Mothma and whatever Luthen's role is. But probably my biggest uh, hope is is to see sort of the, the ISB in action. We know we there's this sort of char female character uh, very hard edge from the previews that we've seen. She has a cadre of death troopers with her. 
we've seen really, I would say the closest that we've seen to the ISB sort of in action is in the Mandalorian with Moff Gideon, although he's not an active ISB agent. Uh, then I guess you could make the argument about Agent Callus and Rebels to some extent, but I want to see that, you know, sort of the counterintelligence arm of the Empire uh, and, and, and actively hunting him and, and sort of trying to root out the rest of the rebellion as well. Jordan. I feel almost blasphemous saying this, but I'm really excited to see how they handle Star Wars without Jedi and without the Force as the kind of center point to the story uh, for it. I really want to see how they handle that because I think it so far has been really, really good in a way that I did not expect to be. I I love the lightsaber duels. I like Josh has seen my lightsaber uh, prop. And so I was not expecting to enjoy that. I'm also kind of excited now to see how they handle Cassian being taken off of uh, his home planet. See how they handle the flashbacks with that too. It needs to be good so that they're continue to be good so that they can have confidence to keep making stories like this and at least the portions of the Mandalorian that don't have Ahsoka or Luke in it. And, and it can be really, really good. And we can love it and it can generate a lot of dollars for them. Mm -hmm. The creativity is something that I'm very excited about. I would add seeing the early days of the rebellion, uh, will they do anything with rebels? I mean, you know, like we've seen the ghost in Rogue One, will we see more of that? Will we get a cameo of Hera? You know, she, she was in the trailer for the Ahsoka series. Yeah, and just from the back of the head, mm -hmm. uh, will we see Ahsoka as Fulcrum? You know, is this is this a way to get Ashley Eckstein to play a much younger uh, Ahsoka? I mean, so again, they they could again, or will that just be too much fan service? To Cal Kestis could show up. Yeah. So again, there's they have all of these options because of this time period that I'm excited for, and they might do absolutely nothing with it. And they just might leave it there as a clay duck and they just <laughs> focus on, you know, the hopefully James Bond story. Cause I, I do wonder like you went in to an Imperial facility with a beard. Did you the shaving profile? Yeah. It's like, he gets bumps when he shaves. It's, okay like and no one noticed <laughs> so it's like so i there's stuff like that that i do wonder of uh i do look forward to the spy aspect but i i also am curious about the opportunities that they might be able to take with uh i mean you have other series being filmed right now where they could just work in a little cameo and that would be fun um uh, or they might not do anything like that. And I'm still going to love it and watch it near midnight every Tuesday night to Wednesday morning because that's what we're going to be doing with this. So, uh, but again, as to as we began, I'm very grateful. We have Star Wars on TV. Star Wars works great as short form storytelling. I'm grateful for this. It's fun. And it just, the fact that right now with all the things that are on TV, shows that it's like the Gen X uh, professionals are the ones who are like making programming. <laughs> this is the toys that we had growing up and we're in charge right now. So here we go. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. So with that, everyone, thanks for tuning in. We will be live streaming again in the future. I wanna thank everyone who participated and until next time, stay safe, stay healthy and stay geeky. Take care.